Okay. So. Okay, so you <clears throat> do you need to spotlight me? Yes, uh, I will oh. do that now. Okay, okay. All right, we can still see you. So I don't know if you've started sharing your screen yet or not, but we can still see no. you, Tony. Okay. <clears throat> Pull my stuff up here. <sighs> Let's see. The marvels of technology, particularly in your 70s. <laughs> oh, you do a great job. Give yourself more credit. Well, thank you. Wait, one of those bars. Okay. There we go. Okay. I messed up here. Go ahead. Hit it. Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, welcome back. Um, so I'm talking to Caitlin, it's been just absolutely beautiful start to the week here. Uh, we've been running 100 plus heat indexes, and all of a sudden we're down in this 60s at night and low 80s in the day. So, well, I'll take this all the rest of summer if we need to. Plus, we got a little bit of rain. In fact, in case we got a lightning strike and struck our building. So that doesn't sound good. So um, what did we learn last week? Well. Last week, we talked about the Levant, and hang on here. I don't know what I've got coming up here. You never know what you're going to get when you start computing. There we go. Uh, we learned the Levant was a term applied to the ancient area and now made up of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Cyprus. And last week, we learned that one of these tribes, the Arameans, had a profound effect on Western civilization when its language became the common speaking language of the, what we now call the Levant, as well as quite a bit of the rest of the world. We learned that another tribe, the Phoenicians, <clears throat> had a huge cultural impact on Western civilization, primarily because they created the first alphabet based on sounds, which became the forerunner to the Greek, the Hebrew, the Latin alphabet. So the Phoenician alphabet, um, led to phonics, which I bet most of you were taught how to read by phonics. We learned the Phoenicians also developed a huge maritime trade that included a whole Mediterranean Sea and beyond, and that they traded in items like purple dye, which was very valuable, glass, cedar wood, wine, embroidery cloth, uh, we learned that many colonies in the Mediterranean basin, including Carthage, became independent civilization of its own around 650. So about 650, the most important of their colonies, Carthage, broke away. And as I mentioned, we'll later see Carthage again when we get to Rome, because they had a huge war with Rome in the uh, second century BC called the Punic Wars. Uh, we learned the Phoenicians were worshippers of Thiel gods, which made them one of the most hated tribes of the Old Testament. Uh, there was a, a lot of talk about the Phoenicians in the Old Testament. They were usually called Canaanites, but uh, they were not well liked for the most part. We learned the Phoenicians were first overrun by the Persians, and then later on they were assimilated into the empire of Alexander the Great. So now we're going to start talking about ancient Israel. We're going to spend three, who knows, maybe four weeks. I have no idea how long this is going to take, but we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the history of, of ancient Israel. Now, remember, my job is basically a job of history. I try to not get into theology because I am most certainly not a theologian. I I am not a Bible scholar, although I've read my Bible backwards and forwards, I won't say hundreds of times, but a lot. And I've studied it and read it, and uh, I have quite a bit of knowledge about the historical background of the Bible, but I'm, I'm still not a biblical expert by any means at all. 
So my job primarily is to place the events of the Bible in the historical context of the times. I'm also trying to affirm uh, some of the events through archeological evidence. We're gonna see a lot of that in the next three or four weeks because there is a lot of archeological evidence supporting the uh, stories of the Bible. So that's what we're gonna be doing for the next three or four weeks. And Pastor Dwayne will be doing the theology aspect. Uh, my cartoon for the week, I love this cartoon. Moses is a kid. He's parting the waters in his glass. Uh, thought that was kind of funny. Okay, so the Bible verse for the day, as for me, this is my covenant with you. He was talking to Abram. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Genesis 17, four through six. So I thought this was a good time to kind of go back to the first day of my presentations. I don't know how many were with me then, but I thought it'd be a good time to go back and kind of review the goals of what I'm trying to accomplish uh, and my kind of philosophy behind it. Remember, my, pre my primary goals are number one, I'm, I'm trying to supplement the Bible by placing it in its historical context, just as I said a few moments ago. I'm trying to confirm the Bible by citing historical references made in the text. So I'm combing the Bible and I'm trying to see what historical aspects we can talk about. And finally, I'm trying to inform by citing archeological, historical and scientific evidence which supports the biblical story. And there is a lot of it, as I said, and uh, I think that's important. It's worth remembering that we do not know how God does what he does. Uh, he is beyond our understanding, as he so beautifully pointed out to Job in chapters 38 and 39. Uh, I, I don't know how many have read Job. Uh, I used to have a hard time with Job, not quite understanding exactly what was going on, but I think I finally got it. And in these two chapters, God is basically telling Job, you're not me. You may be smart but you're not smart enough to understand exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. So have faith in me and stop trying to figure me out and stop trying to be as smart as me. I think once we get to that point in our life studying the Bible, then I think things begin to make a little bit more sense, uh, particularly for secularists who who disbelieve a lot of the Bible because they say that things like this could not have occurred. So with that in mind, let's kind of review the fact that, that it's my philosophy and I've, and I've kind of gone over this with Pastor Dwayne and he's kind of hand in hand with me here that science and scripture can be reconciled. It can be reconciled. Because God created the scientific laws of this universe. Sir Isaac Newton may have looked up and had an apple fall on his head, and he may have been the one that set down the, the laws of the universe. But trust me, God created those laws. Uh, a scientific explanation does not preclude God's presence in an event. So, uh, just because something can be explained away by science doesn't mean that God didn't have his hand in it. Because, see, I believe he doesn't have to obey the laws of science, but that doesn't mean he has to violate them either. He can, he can create miracles out of the, anything in my, in my belief, but it doesn't mean that he can't use the laws of science to do the things that he wants to do. So that means that the hand of God, you know, may be evident even when God, even when science gives us a measure of understanding. So just because science can explain something doesn't mean that God didn't have something to do with it. In fact, you know, I believe God has something to do with everything that happens in this world. So that's kind of a review of the goals and, and my philosophy in teaching this. So 
Let's talk a little bit about the Bible's history. For much of early Western history, the Bible was the only primary source of historical information we had, not just about the origins of the Hebrew people, but about ancient history as well. For centuries, we knew very little about ancient history, except what we found out in the Bible. Uh, remember a few weeks back, we talked about a group of people called the Hittites. Remember I told you the Hittites were virtually an unknown group of people except for about four minor references in the Bible. And up until the 20th century, the people thought the Hittites were just a little small tribe of people. Well, come to find out when archeology span began to really take hold, we found tons of evidence to indicate that the Hittite people were a huge civilization that had a great impact that rivaled in its height, both Assyria and Egypt. So, you know, for the long time, the Bible was the only source of knowledge we had about certain events in ancient history. But that all began to change about the 17th, uh, 16th, 17th century during what we call the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance was a great time of cultural development. We all know about the paintings. We all know people like Leonardo da Vinci and Galileo and uh, Rembrandt and Michelangelo, pardon me, Michelangelo and Raphael. And, and we know all about these, these gigantic leaps in knowledge. And that's all good and true. But unfortunately, one of the things we don't realize about that period of time is a lot of times that it was a very humanistic movement. Uh, they really begin to cast aspersions upon the Bible. And basically, a lot of these people were not not biblically believers. They did not believe in the words of the Bible. And as a result, the Bible kind of lost its footing within the historical and scientific community during the 1600s, the 1400s, 1500s. And it only grew in the enlightenment period of the 17th and the 19th century. But that began to change about the latter part of the 1800s because there was a new movement starting called biblical archeology, span uh, created primarily by a trained archeologist, a man by the name of William Albright. i uh, got a feeling, I bet somebody's probably heard about William Albright. He was the first person that really said, I think the stories of the Bible can be actually proven and archeologically proven. I think there's a lot of evidence out there. We just have to find it. So he started, what is called the Modern Biblical Archaeological Movement. And it is still active, it's very strong. Uh, it has a journal, which is very read worldwide. And it's an extremely powerful movement, even yet today. Uh, as a result of it, uh, we found things that we never thought we would find, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Actually, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found as an accident, but they were interpreted by the biblical archaeologists. The Tel Dan Stella, which we're going to talk about, Hezekiah's Tunnel, which we've already talked about. We uh, found what we think is St. Peter's House, the Siloam Pool, and many, many more. These were all provided historical verification to the accounts of the Bible, and that's exactly what William Albright intended to do. He said, I'm I'm going to prove to you that the things that talked about in the Bible were true events. And a lot of uh, a lot of these events can now be proven, not just from the Bible, but from extant sources and archaeological finds. Of course, that still didn't prevent detractors from uh, continuing to solve on the Bible. And primarily that's fueled by the political landscape in the Levant. And I don't want to get into that because that's politics, but uh, the political landscape does not lend itself to believing the biblical account of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, there's a group of people, still minimalist, some of them are, are Israelis, that interpret the Bible as a legendary text, and they question the historical accuracy of almost every part of the Bible, and including the denial of the patriarch period, and particularly the denial of the patriarch period. Uh, they they uh, deny the conquest of Canaan by Joshua. Uh, they believe that David and Solomon were mythological creatures. And if they actually did live, they were just little warlords who governed a little city. 
So there's a group of people out there that still don't believe in the Bible. That's why it's important that historians and archaeologists present their finds to support the story of the Bible, because the more evidence we have, the greater it is to be able to convince people that aren't Christians to become Christians. So this is William Albright. Uh, very profound figure in the history of biblical archaeology. So let's kind of start with our review of the next three or four weeks of is ancient Israel and its history. And when I go through this, I'm going to try to cite certain archaeological or historical facts and finds that, that affirm the story of the Bible. So we all know that Abram left Ur of the Chaldees. We talked about that some weeks ago. Uh, he went first to Haran uh, up on the Euphrates River, and then God told him to travel to Canaan, the land of uh, you know the milk and honey. And we think by around somewhere around 2165, nobody knows for sure. Uh, he arrived at a little place called Shechem, north of Jerusalem, and it was here that God supposedly, according to the Bible, met with Abram, and he said, to your offspring, I will give this land. That's the source at the Abrahamic covenant. That's the source of a lot of the ill feelings in the uh, landscape of the Holy Lands today, because lots of groups of people do not believe that the Jewish people have ownership to that land, even though According to the Bible, God gave it to Abraham. Abraham probably looked around at the country that God had just promised him and thought, scratched his head and thought, boy, what did I do to deserve this? Uh, it was a patchwork country. It had a multitude of nomadic tribes that didn't like each other, that fought with each other. And on top of that, it was right in the middle of a, one of the worst famines to hit the ancient world. Uh, he probably wondered, God, why did you give me this land? <laughs> you know, uh, it was not exactly the best looking land at that period of time. And it was a land that he was going to have to fight for, or at least his ancestors were going to, his descendants were going to have to fight for. So, <clears throat> pardon me while I get a drink here. I'm a little thirsty. So, we know the next thing, according to the Bible, that Abraham did was decide to go to Egypt. He went to Egypt, took his family to Egypt. Uh, it was also famine ridden, and it just so happened to be in the midst of a lot of chaos because it was on the weak periods of Egyptian history, which we'll talk about later. Um, and they really didn't think much of Canaanites. And you got to look at it from the point of view. At that point in time, Abraham would have been considered a Canaanite. He was from the land of Canaan. And the Egyptians did not have any love for the Canaanites. They called them Western Asiatics. They called them vile. They called them a crocodile on a riverbank. Uh, they were not exactly looked upon kindly by the Egyptians at that point in their history. Uh, we know that uh, Abraham, according to the Bible, got a little bit of a trouble with the Pharaoh over his wife. Uh, we all know that story that he tried to... Uh, give uh, Sarah over as his sister, which in fact, she was his half sister. And uh, Pharaoh found out about it, got upset. And one of the things he did was basically send him on his way, send him packing, said, get back, get out of here, go back to Canaan. So Abram returned to Canaan, finally settled around Hebron. It wasn't Hebron then, but it is now. Uh, he lived for the rest of his life. He fathered Ishmael by Hagar, the ancestor of the Arab people. He watched God's wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, remember, God got upset with Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, that's where his nephew Lot was living. Uh, he received the covenant of circumcision by God to seal the covenant. And then he fathered Isaac, from whom the Hebrew nation would spring. All these events took place and are you know, talked about in the Bible. Isaac, in turn, would father Esau, the father of the Edomites, and Jacob by Rebekah, 
And Jake, of course, when Mary, the sisters, Lee and Rachel, which you've all remembered the story about that. Uh, he wanted to marry Rachel. And unfortunately, Leah was the older sister and he got Leah by mistake. And then he got Rachel too and moved back to um, the land of his father and finally ended up raising 12 sons from whom the 12 tribes of Israel would emanate. And of course, we know that his younger of those, uh, Joseph would then be sold into slavery. He would rise to power and then reunite his family in Egypt. And the Hebrew would basically spend about the next 400 years in Egypt. So that's the patriarchal story. Now, this is the land of the Canaanites, as you can see here. And you can, and of course, there weren't really borders. These people were nomads. But this will give you some idea of the location of the people. The Philistines, of course, were located where basically around what we know as the Gaza Strip today. Uh, there was a little group of Hittites here and some Hittites up here. There were Amorites over on this bank of the Jordan, along with the Moabites and the Edomites to the south. There were Amorites over here also. There were Jebusites, uh, just Canaanites here. Canaanites where Phoenicia was. Perizzites, Hivites. There were different groups of Canaan people, and these people didn't like each other. They were warlike. They fought each other a lot. Now, uh, a lot of historians, as I said, question if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were even real people. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, there's no evidence they actually lived. Well, of course not, folks. They were nomads. They lived in you know, basically a desert type land and they're a very arid part of the country, the world. They followed the sheep, they live in tents. They would not have left archeological evidence. That should not surprise any of us that there's not any historical record other than the Bible of these three individuals. So here's what we have to do. If, if we want to affirm the story through evidence, then we need to look at the events that are talked about in this period of time, the patriarchal period, and see if there's anything there that we can put our finger on as actually occurring. And one of the most important events that occurred was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you can prove Sodom and Gomorrah existed, if you can prove, if you can prove or give evidence to prove the story about its destruction can be proven, then, you know, that's pretty good evidence that the Bible knew what it was talking about. And so we know that in Genesis 19.24, that uh, the Bible said the Lord rained down burning sulfur upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they were, it was two evil cities. They were located in what was known as the cities of the plain. That's what is described in Genesis 1928. And we know that from Hebron, the area around Hebron where Abraham lived then, that he could see from the hilltops, the, the plains, the cities of the plains. They were located somewhere around the Southern end of the Dead Sea. Now, the problem was for many, many years, we could not find any evidence of where these cities were because number one, the Dead Sea area at the time of Abraham was much smaller than it was throughout most of history. And it began to grow and many of the cities and areas and ruins began to be submerged. But now we live in a period where the Dead Sea is once again kind of receding. And so now there is beginning to be areas where archeologists are going and they're uncovering evidence of Sodom and Gomorrah. For instance, 1973, a couple of archeologists by the name of Rast and Schaub began excavating two ruins of two cities that had been uh, exposed by the recession of the Dead Sea. And they found evidence, archeological evidence through dating time uh, areas that they could probably somewhere around 2000 BC that they were destroyed by combustible materials from the earth, namely sulfur and bitumen, possibly as a result of an earthquake. So these people narrowed it down through time, through uh, you know, dating 
techniques that around 2000, these two ruined cities that they found were destroyed. That would have been about the time of Abraham. That's an important thing. Because if you can prove that Sodom and Gomorrah existed and you can prove that they were destroyed the same way the Bible says they were destroyed, then that's pretty good evidence that in fact, uh, the Abrahamic story, the patriarch period existed. Their conclusion, it is clear that the infamous cities of Sodom and Gomorrah have now been found. What is more, the evidence demonstrates that the Bible provides an accurate eyewitness account of events that occurred over 4,000 years ago. So it's in their estimation, they're trained archeologists that the events of Sodom and Gomorrah actually occurred just as the Bible said they occurred. Uh, and they have evidence. Here's for instance, a sulfur ball that's embedded in the ash remaining from the destroyed buildings. This is brimstone, uh, talks about this in the Bible. It's a, it's a different form of sulfur because it's been cooked. Sulfur that's been cooked will turn to what we call brimstone. Down here is naturally occurring sulfur. This is cooked sulfur, brimstone. This only could have occurred through an earthquake, a volcanic explosion, whatever. It had to be superheated. So it's very evident that, you know, brimstone rained down upon, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, pretty interesting because, you know, this really gives some evidence that this happened. Now, the next event, of course, is the exile to Egypt. It would have been around 1870 to about 1400. It, that four to 450 year period would have been the years that Joseph uh, brought his family to Egypt and that they, they, reigned in Egypt, they, they settled down uh, in that part of the country. Uh, the Bible tells us Joseph and his brothers settled in the Delta region called the land of Goshen. Uh, and over the next 400 years, they multiplied in numbers. If we know one thing about the Hebrews, they like to have children. And it went from a, a clan of 70, 80 people to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, over a period of about three to 400 years. They multiplied in vast numbers. They were initially welcomed by the Pharaoh. Uh, we think the Pharaoh of Joseph and his family was probably a man by the name of Sinseret III. Uh, we can kind of place it in the right time and the events that Joseph talks about, you know, that talk about in Joseph in the in the Bible, all kind of correspond to a period of time of this man by the name of Sinseret the third was the Egyptian Pharaoh. We're gonna talk more about Joseph when we get to Egypt. Uh, their presence later became a problem because Egypt in turn was invaded by what we think were Canaanites. They called them Hyksos. And since the Hebrews once came from Canaan, uh, they were associated with these Baals Asiatics. And once Egypt, Egypt got their country back, there was a period of about 175 years there that the Hyksos kind of took over parts of Egypt. And the Egyptians finally drove them out. Well, as a result, Joseph and his family who were welcomed, all of a sudden, their descendants were not nearly as welcome. Remember the Bible talks about a group of people that knew not Joseph, you know. Eventually, Hyksos were driven out by the Egyptians and the Hebrews were rounded up by the Pharaoh and used as forced labor in his building projects, which in turn led to a Hebrew to deliver Moses, whom the Bible said God used to convince Pharaoh to let my people go through a series of plagues. We all know the story. We've all seen the Ten Commandments. We've all seen Yul Brenner as the Pharaoh. We've all seen Charles the Heston as Moses. We know the story backwards and forwards. Uh, we, we've heard it all of our life. Traditionally, most historians thought the Pharaoh of the Bible was a man by the name of Ramesses II, who lived in the 1200s BC. But that's kind of been discounted as of late. Uh, more and more historians are beginning to place the 
favorable of the Bible, more likely a little bit earlier, around 1400 or so, uh, under the leadership of a man by the name of Amenhotep II. Uh, the reason for this is clear. There's events that occurred that corresponded with the plagues. There's also uh, events that occurred that lend credence to the Hebrews of that period of time. And more importantly, it also corresponds with the time of if, you know, the Bible is very specific about generations and how many years went by between the Exodus and the building of the temple. And if you extrapolate that backwards, it probably was more in the 1400s rather than the 1200s BC. So historians are kind of uh, looked now more towards the 1400 area. And this includes biblical scholars for the most part. So if Amenhotep II was indeed the favor of the Bible, then the plagues and resulting exodus of the Hebrews can be explained uh, for the most part by either a catastrophic volcanic explosion that happened on a little island called Santorini in the Mediterranean, which destroyed something called the Minoan civilization. We're gonna talk about them a little bit later. Uh, the explosion is thought by geologists to be one of the largest in history and caused massive earthquakes and tsunamis. Uh, tsunamis. Uh, the largest earthquake recorded in history occurred in the 1800s out in the uh, area around Indonesia, the island of Java, a little island called Krakatoa. And it said that the sound of that earthquake, that volcanic explosion, uh, was heard clear around the world. I think we all remember uh, the explosion of Mount St. Helens back in the 1980s. Well, Krakatoa was huge compared to the events of Mount St. Helens. Uh, it was like four and five times as large as Mount St. Helens. Scientists have studied the volcanic explosion of Santorini in the 1400s, and they said it was anywhere between four to five times larger than the one at Krakatoa. It is probably the largest volcanic explosion in the history of the world. So what kind of effect would have that had 400 miles away? Folks, that's pretty easy to see. We know what kind of effect it would have had. For instance, it would have caused massive floods. We know that the Nile River is a very narrow river and it has lots of red soil upon its banks. It would have very easily turned red. It would have turned foul. Uh, once it turned foul, the frogs would have left. Once the frogs left in massive numbers because it was so foul, it wasn't pure anymore, that lice would have formed and the frogs would have died. Flies, of course, would have formed, which would have created pestilence upon cattle. Uh, that pestilence probably spread to humans in the form of boils. On top of that, the volcanic explosion would have called massive fire and hail balls. Uh, that happens all the time in volcanic explosions. Uh, that would have destroyed most of the uh, plant life, which would have encouraged the locust to come down. And of course, it also would have created probably darkness. Now, it doesn't explain the death of the firstborn and nothing ever is going to explain that because that is a true genuine miracle by God, in my opinion. And he worked by supernatural means that cannot be explained. These other things, I'm not saying they didn't occur because of God, because actually they, I think they did occur. That goes back to what I said. God doesn't have to violate his laws of science that he created. He can use the events of the world to do his will. And a lot of biblical archeologists, a lot of biblical scholars believe that that's exactly what happened. This is Santorini. It's, it's, uh, in the Aegean Sea, about 400 miles away. This used to be an island, and now it's, a, <laughs> it's nothing. There's not much there because it blew its top about 1400, and it really blew its top. Uh, also called Thera. Well, we know because of the plagues, the Bible said, uh, the Hebrews said, we want to go. And uh, 
Pharaoh didn't want him to leave, but eventually he gave up because of all these plagues, and particularly the plague of the last born, of the firstborn, where uh, they were killed. Now, do we have any other evidence besides this this theory that the volcano would have caused the uh, the events of the plagues? Yeah, we do. There was a papyrus scroll found in the 19th century called the Ipuwer Papyrus. Uh, it was written down in the 19th century, or pardon me, in, in the period of time about 1400. And it described the events that were going on in Egypt about the same time that we think the plagues were occurring. Uh, we could not read this for centuries. But finally, a man by the name of Gardner, very famous Egyptologist, uh, was able to translate it. And the papyrus described a violent time in Egypt, starvation, drought, escape of slaves, uh, with the wealthy Egyptian death throughout the land. And it's important that this was written by an Egyptian named man by the name of Ipuwer, and it appears to be an eyewitness to the plagues. Now, this is really important, folks, because not very document, not very many documents and text survived from common everyday Egyptians. Number one, most of them couldn't write. Number two, most of them that could were documenting the events of the pharaohs because that was their job. So when you find something that was written by what we would call a common man describing the events of the land, that's a pretty big thing. Uh, and this is a huge piece of document. It's not very well known. And you can use your own judgment as why it's not very well known. For instance, here, Papyrus 210, all the waters that were in the Nile were turned to blood. That's not the Bible. That's written from an Egyptian at the period of time that these events were going on. Papyrus 414, 61, trees are destroyed, no fruit or herbs are found. 210, gates, columns, walls are consumed by fire, just like described in the Bible. The land is not light. Again, just like it's described in the Bible, darkness reigned. The children of princes are dashed against the walls. The children of princes are cast out in the streets. So what does that mean? Well, we know that in periods of stress that ancient people often sacrificed children to please their God. I know that sounds horrible to us, and it is horrible. But folks, it happened more often than we want to believe. Uh, there were many times that the ancient people, once they faced with very stressful situations, thought the only way to please their God was to sacrifice their children. And I know you might say, how could anybody do that? Remember, folks, Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac to, to his God until God intervened and said, no, I was testing you. You are not to do that. And we know from Mosaic law later that that was absolutely forbidden to the Hebrews. But folks, this was not something that was unusual. It's important that these events described were described by Egyptians. They weren't in the Bible. They were described by other documents. Now, this is the Ipuwer pap papyrus that we talked about. So what evidence is there of the Exodus? And I just want to go through this and then we'll stop, okay? Uh, we know that the Exodus according to the Bible, occurred. Now, there isn't any record of it. And historians, again, have said, well, if the Egyptians didn't write it down, being such a big event, it must not have occurred. Well, no offense to historians, but that's stupid. Because the Egyptians would not have written down about an event that, number one, basically was a butt kicking to them, and number two, a nose thumbing to their gods. They weren't going to do this. You think they wanted the people of the land to know that the Hebrews and their God had basically thumbed their nose at their gods and basically defeated the Egyptian Pharaoh? He wasn't about to write this. Remember, the Nile, which is the lifeblood of Egypt, was also thought as the bloodstream of Osiris. That's one of their chief gods. Frogs were sacred to Osiris. Uh, 
If frogs begin to die, that's not a good thing. When the sun went dark, that was basically their god, Amun-Ra, who was their chief god, going dark. The Egyptians would not have written about these events. These were not celebratory events in Egyptian history. So the parting of the Reed Sea, and we all know now that the newer translations that have really got into translating, it really was not the Red Sea, but it was the Reed Sea. Uh, the resulting Santini, Santorini explosion we talked about in the tsunami. Uh, there's also other events that occurred that could have explained how the waters were parted. Uh, just recently, just in the last 10 years, a man by the name of Carl Drews, who works for the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the United States, not exactly a biblical research facility. Trust me, the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Uh, but he studied the events uh, that are described, and he studied all this. This was his job, was studying weather. And he went back, and he got interested in it. He started this talking about or reading about the Reed Sea, and he was able to conclude that the Reed Sea was probably what was called Lake Tannis uh, in the Delta. Lake Tannis, by the way, no longer exists because when they built the Suez Canal, it went away. He further concluded that in that area, there's winds that come from the east that sometimes if they blow as hard as 63 miles an hour, they will actually expose the land bridge on Lake Tannis. Uh, he studied this, he did computer models, he was able to see it. Uh, he found evidence that it still occurs today. There's still these, these what's called wind set downs that occurred on Lake Erie, on the Nile Delta. So this is Lake Tannis, it no longer exists. This is the Suez Canal right through here now. But this would have been the area he's talking about where the crossing of the Exodus probably would have occurred. And what he said was that if winds blow as much as 63 miles an hour this way, it would have exposed the land. And the minute those winds set down, the waters would have rushed back in. Now, does that mean that God didn't make that happen? Absolutely not, folks. I don't know how God separated the waters. I know that he did it. And I know the Bible says that hundreds if not thousands of Pharaoh's troops were destroyed. I have no doubt that that's exactly what happened. But the point is that you can explain these things through science, and that in turn gives affirmation to the Bible. So from that point on, the Hebrews are now in what's called the Sinai Peninsula, and they begin their 40-year journey. That's what we're going to take up talking about next week is the 40 years in the wilderness. I hope you've enjoyed this. I, I hope I'm able to affirm the stories of the Bible as I intend. 